So welcome back, everybody, to um, the fourth lecture in our series of Rhind Lectures delivered by Professor Teresa Singleton. And in lecture two, we were introduced to the Gullah Geechee communities of Georgia. And now we're going to revisit them and go in and take a deeper dive into the world of the Gullah Geechee. So over to you, Teresa. Oh, thank you. Um, in this talk, I'm really going to be talking about some of the recent um, heritage issues that I got involved with um, um, in, with the Gallup Geechee, and particularly um, the descendants of uh, Butler Island Plantation, which I talked about um, yesterday, the descendants um, of that, uh, the descendants of the enslaved people of that plantation. Um, but uh, first, I wanted to just sort of briefly look at or mention about the national heritage sites um, that deal with African American life in the United States. And this is sort of a, a breakdown. Um, some of these numbers are changing as new sites um, are added. But, um, but basically, there's been a real effort to try to get more sites that are recognized nationally that deal with African American life. Um, this, the inclusion of African American sites on the uh, various, in these various categories really only began in the uh, 70s um, with, with, with a few sites. And then um, now there's, in, I'd say in the past 15 to 20 years has been more of an effort. And so National Register sites are sites that um, um, you file an application uh, it doesn't really offer any protection. Uh, in fact, the owners can do almost anything with <laughs> the site, but it, it gets you know, some recognition. And usually, because it's a national registered property, you know, it has um, most people who are going to submit an application like this or group or organization. You know, they're going to take some effort to try to uh, preserve it. And so uh, this, this US number of 95,000, actually, I, I just found out that 95,000 are, are just what's uh, the total. Pro well, it's not the total. It's like with, it's actually total US is probably over a million. It's just that some of these are. Um, uh, within the 95,000, some of these are like districts. So within a district, you might have 50 or 100 individual properties. And so that's what makes it go over the uh, million or up to a million in that category. But, but on the same time, African-American is 1,900, which is actually more than I thought, but that's only about 2%. And then national landmarks, national parks, and national monuments, uh, the, and, and national, the, the, the remaining four, these can only be um, declared through an act of Congress. The United States Congress has to uh, vote on these. And so that's why you see there, there are much fewer of, of those. And um, in, 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 in all the, the different categories. Um, and National Mo Memorials is actually a, a recent category, or at least the, at one point, the National Memorials and National Monuments were um, considered together, but for some reason they decided to make that a separate category. The one national memorial that's African American is the Martin Luther for Martin Luther King. Um, national monuments can be declared 
by uh, singularly by a, a U.S. Uh, president. And actually, the six national monuments that are African American, those were declared by Obama and Trump. He actually declared uh, at least, um, I think, one or two. So, so that's uh, a very so the African American national monuments, you know, they're, they're very recent. I think there are a few, maybe two or three, that were um, that predated uh, President Obama. But that's just to give you some sense of what uh, sort of national recognition, the numbers of national um, recognized sites in the different categories that relate to African, um, African Americans. Um, going back to the Gullah Geechee, I showed this, um, this was my last slide uh, yesterday afternoon. And one of the things that um, happened when I, re um, well, since I finished my work at Butler Island, which was, you know, I hate to say it, 40, well, I guess 42 years ago, because that's when I got my PhD. And uh, when I returned, when I was when I was doing the work I was describing yesterday at Butler Island, for example, there just really wasn't that much interest among the descendants of Butler Island or the Gullah Geechee at the time. In fact, there, people didn't even, um, or many of the people didn't even, they identified as Gullah Geechee, but but they really didn't want to talk about uh, their heritage uh, that much. Um, some had felt that they had been discriminated against, um, not just by whites, but but non um, Gullah Geechee blacks, and 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 so they they weren't really celebrating their African American or Gullah Geechee heritage at the time I was doing my fieldwork. Well, that has all changed um, uh, now, or, or has changed in the, I'd say in the past uh, 20 years or so. Uh, this particular brochure I picked up, I believe, in um, one of my trips in the early uh, 2000s. Um, I've, since, since 2000, I've been there about five uh, different times. And um, you know, for various uh, reasons, but um, but so there, there's been a, a complete reversal of what I experienced when I was doing uh, my field work. Um, in 2008, um, I was invited to participate in a conference on um, African American life in the Georgia Low Country. And the conference papers were later published in 2010 um, in the book um, by that name and edited by Philip uh, Morgan, who's a well-known uh, Southern historian. And, and, and my chapter in that book was Reclaiming the Gullah Geechee Pass, Archaeology of Slavery in Coastal Georgia. And basically, I pretty much updated uh, some of the work that I had done. Um, and, and, it, and at that time, there had been additional work done on uh, Saplo Island that I talked about, and as well as some other uh, contract projects um, uh, just south of, uh, of Savannah. Um, one of the reasons for that conference, although I never really did ever, uh, I was invited, but no one ever really told me why they were having this conference. I mean, I mean not to say that they had to have it a reason, but, but um, I believe now when I think back on it, it must have been um, because there was uh, an effort to establish a Gullah Geechee cultural heritage corridor and the U.S. Congress established this. It was actually um, established under the George Walker Bush administration. It was one of those things. U.S. presidents have this way of 
declaring um, monuments and cultural heritage um, preserves and um, natural preserves when they're get, getting ready to go out of, all, you know, in their last year or two uh, in office. And that's uh, what um, George Walker Bush did. And this was an effort to uh, preserve the, um, the I, I had say here, the living heritage, but actually also the uh, archaeological sites and you know the tangible and intangible heritage. Uh, because what, what had happened or what has been happening even when I was doing my field work is many of the Gala Geechee have um, been dispossessed of their lands um, with uncontrolled, unregulated development, you know, of the barrier islands and the adjacent wetlands. And um, with few economic opportunities, there's been a great deal of out migration. And so um, people have been um, advocates for the Galagichi and the Galagichi themselves have um, been concerned about this, that, you know, that they, you know, they were losing, um, you know, the young people and there wouldn't be people who would carry on uh, these traditions or, um, you know, their language, Gala, wouldn't be spoken anymore. So there was, so the idea of this uh, cultural corridor was to, or is, is to, to, um, preserve the cultural heritage of the Galagichi, both tangible and intangible, within that 12,000 square mile area that I uh, talked about um, on yesterday. And they, um, they uh, it, uh, our federal commission was assigned to manage the corridor. This would be under the uh, National Park Service, which really maintains all of the all of the categories of national um, um, sites that I showed in the first side. Well, uh, is managed by the Park Service, and the Galagichi Heritage Corridor would be one of those things that would be come under the Park Service, and they have a independent, um, federally appointed commission to manage and implement um, the objectives of the corridor. And uh, these objectives, which I've listed here, to recognize, sustain, and celebrate Galagichi contributions, to assist state, local, and private organizations in interpreting and preserving Galagichi culture, to assist in identifying sites, artifacts, uh, historical data, uh, to support heritage-related economic development, and then um, to preserve the land and natural resources associated with Galagichi Geechee culture. So they, um, I mean, these are very ambitious uh, goals, I think, but certainly um, ones that the Galagichi and, and people who are concerned about their future, you know, would, would support. Um, the question is, do they have any real influence? And the two examples that I'm going to talk about suggest that they may not. Um, but going back to what I was saying earlier about Butler Island um, has now become um, a, a significant, or, well, well, the Galagichi in general have been, um, since I did my field work, uh, have, have been actively trying to uh, preserve their heritage. And Butler Island in particular has become a historic uh, heritage site with a number of uh, family tree uh, genealogy projects um, that have developed from um, Butler Island. Um, as I mentioned, Butler, the Butler plantations are very well documented. And when you think of uh, over 900, um, that they had over 900 enslaved people 
um, at its peak. Um, a number of people have been going through these records and trying to um, construct their uh, family histories. In fact, there, there was a, there are a number of YouTube um, videos presenting, well, actually showing people or telling people about the different records that they could um, look at to, f to find their histories and, you know, and then individuals presenting their, the kinds of things they came up with. Also, uh, Butler Islands, uh, when I was working there, there were certainly no tours or uh, stories about, about the island. Um, but, but now that's, that's all changed. There's, uh, these events don't happen um, all the time, but they you know, happen often enough. Um, and so, so people really see Butler, or the Gullah Geechee really see Butler Island as, as an important um, heritage site. One thing too that um, intrigued me, um, remember yesterday I talked about the, the Dutch engineers, uh, this, the, slate, the first, the historical marker for Butler Island in 19, that was put up in 1957, talks about uh, Pierce, well, Major Butler, and then his grandson Pierce Butler and Fanny Kimball and the Dutch engineers who came and built the ir irrigation um, ditches so in order to um, cultivate rice. But the new sign, or n I think both signs are up. I actually haven't seen this uh, enslaved centered sign because um, that, just, that just went up in 2019. And while I was on the Georgia coast, in 2019, I spent most of my time in St. Simons and didn't get over to Butler Island. But basically that sign um, talks about the enslaved people, how they cultivated these you know, millions, billions of um, pounds of, of rice and, you know, and, you know, and their situation. So this again shows the um, more information, more, that now um, the people in the surrounding community have really um, accepted Butler Island as an important uh, heritage uh, site. And the fact that uh, Butler Island, um, since the 50s, had been owned and managed by the state of Georgia you know, I at no time anticipated, or at least it was far from my, that, that that situation would change, that, they, that, that somehow that that site would be in peril. And yet, that's, that's, that's not the case. It is very much its future is in jeopardy because um, in, on February 5th, 2020, um, it was introduced in the state legislature of Georgia uh, that the um, state would have be able to sell acreage from 122 state heritage preserves. And they, they wanted to be able to do this without public hearing, hearings or any community input. And the legislation was GAHB 906. Um, it would also repeal the 1975 Georgia Heritage Trust Act, which specifies the conditions under which um, state properties should be disposed of uh, that are, you know, um, that are now protected, and specifically says there should be at least public hearings, and and that you wouldn't just be able to sell any property, you'd look at it case by case. And this, what this law would say, well, any of all the 122 state heritage preserves, that they would be able to have that automatic 
possibility to um, sell acreage, not necessarily the whole um, park, but that's uh, but at least um, some of the acreage. With, again, without giving any um, public notice. And what was what I think actually prompted this was the fact that negotiations were already in process to sell Butler Island as a distillery. I mean, to to be to build a, a distillery. Um, so, so I think that what whoever the state legislatures they saw this as an opportunity if they could get the sale through for Butler Island, then this legislation, if it became law, would give them that same ability with all the state um, heritage preserves. Well, they either underestimated um, Georgians because <laughs> I mean, my phone was ringing off the hook. <laughs> I, you know, I, I got. I, I remember when I first learned about this. I had all these emails about about this. I mean, I live in. I'm not uh, a native of. I'm not a citizen. I mean, not a resident of Georgia, and I, you know, live in New York. But, you know, I was just getting all these um, emails and phone calls about uh, this, and so. Uh, Virtually, and all this was during the pandemic, and um, what people were able to do was really mobilize and um, protest this um, this um, legislation. In this um, slide, not for sale. This is one of the barrier islands, Osaba Island, which is near uh, Savannah. Are right off the, uh, or it's right off the, the, this is the barrier island that's closest to Savannah. And it says in here, it mentions about Butler Island is destined, if this law passed, Butler Island is destined to be a, um, a distillery. And, um, and even um, President, former President Jimmy Carter, got into the act, and he wrote a letter explaining to whoever proposed it about the, it seems like the, um, I read the legislation, the bill that they were trying to pass, and they didn't even mention the historic act of 1976, but they did say that that bill would repeal any previous acts. But what uh, Carter says is that you know they made these promises to the donors, um, particularly the woman who donated Osaba Island. You know, you know he he anticipated. Oh, he doesn't say here say that, but but um, you know presumably the the, the uh, families could sue. You know because they were promised that the state would keep these these uh, uh, properties, and so. He's urging the legislatures, uh, le legislature, not to pass this um, pass this um, proposed legislation. And fortunately, the bill failed in uh, I think it was March of was it? No, no, it couldn't have been March. Um, it, it fit because this was June. But anyway, it, before the end of 2020. The, um, the law failed. Um, however, those who, the advocates for the law, feel that it was the wording that made people upset <laughs> and that they have vowed that they're going to reintroduce it at a later date, um, you know, and come up with more acceptable wording of the bill. Well, well, I don't know if that's going to happen. But I mean, these sites are safe for now, but people are concerned that it's not going to be long term. And, you know, so here's the, the fight in particular to save Butler Island. This was an um, event that occurred uh, in October um, where 
where there was a major protest to um, rally people about saving Butler Island. You know, if um, I, I participated in a couple of um, online town meetings, and one of the plans or one of the ideas is for uh, you know to privately purchase Butler Island, you know, from the state, or, or somehow be able to turn it into uh, you know a private uh, ownership or at least partially private ownership or, or something like that because it seems like the state of Georgia really wants to get rid of some of these properties and it's anticipated that that is um, going to happen eventually and there's this friends of uh, friends of uh, Friends of Preserve, Butler Island. That doesn't. Anyway, this, that's from their Facebook. I I haven't joined. I haven't um, friended them yet, but I I think I will uh, get involved in this. So so that's where Butler Island is at the point. In addition to Butler Island, um, the um, Another site related, closely related to Butler Island and closely related to the uh, Butler family plantations is just referred to as the Weeping Time site. Um, and the Weeping Time was uh, the sale of 436 enslaved persons, including 30 children, 30 babies, um, in 1859 uh, that occurred in uh, Savannah, Georgia. And, uh, and I witness it's called the Weeping Time because apparently uh, an eyewitness account said that it violently rained, or rained uh, steadily during the whole time with violent woods, violent winds, for the entire two-day stale. And so that's why it's called the weeping time. But um, Ann Bailey, who wrote the, a book, The Weeping Time, she found that the um, enslaved people referred to it as the weeping time because this was the first time um, many of them had to face having to be, you know, ha having to they face having to be, I'm sorry, this is the first time they face being sold um, and separated from their families because um, the Butler Island, most of the Butler Island um, population are, are, are the Butler plantations. People just stayed there for generations. There, there wasn't a, a great deal of, of uh, selling of at least not, you know, maybe some individuals, but not wholesale selling uh, a lot of people who'd been there for um, multiple uh, generations. So that's the reason she says the enslaved people referred to it as the weeping time. And she also found it was the largest slave auction in the history of the United States. Um, and I guess you're thinking, well, why, what happened? Well, supposedly um, Pierce Butler uh, had had a lot of um, bills, debts from gambling and other uh, activities, you know, poor investments. And so uh, this is a description in the newspaper, the for sale, long cotton and rice, Negroes. Um, well, this is 460, but I think the actual number was 432. And then um, this other source is a person who was at the sale and describes what, what went on. Um, the sale was advertised nationally, and so you had people from all over coming to uh, purchase these um, 
436 enslaved people. And Butler cleared 300,000 $805 in 1859. So you can only imagine how much money that was back in 1859. So he was able to pay his debt as well as restore uh, a great deal of his um, wealth. Um, most, what makes this this the auction, the weeping time, so unique is that you know, the, just the sheer number. Uh, most slave auctions, you know, people were sold in small groups of maybe 10, 20, or 30 at the most, and they usually were sold in um, you know storefronts like like this building, like these group of buildings. But because this sale was so large, it was sold at the horse racetrack. Uh, this is a historical, I mean, or this is a rendering of it. You can't, I have other images of it, but, but anyway, it was so large, it was sold at the, at the Tan um, Brook racetrack. Um, today, the weeping time is commemorated in West Savannah, which is a predominantly African-American neighborhood, which does have um, some issues. I mean, you know, it's, you know, food, some of the things that you have in a lot of African-American neighborhoods, food, desert, uh, um, not everyone's impoverished, but at least I think 30% of the population lives below the poverty line. So, so, they, so there are some um, social and economic problems there. Um, it was formerly, uh, this, this is the green area, but there, this area used to be, used to have public housing, which was demolished. And so now it's a green area, and um, there's this little park where there's um, um, a historical marker which uh, was installed in 2000, 2008. And um, in talking with some of the people who live in that neighborhood, you know, they had big hopes of you know, having like a, a real monument or some other kind of uh, major memorial place there. But again, like Butler Island, um, uh, the Weeping Time site is also threatened. I mean, in the case of the Weeping Time site, it, it seems pretty certain that it's going to be redeveloped. And this is just showing the race tract. Um, you know, it's here, it's uh, uh, Quasi de Graff Hansen. He's a landscape architect that uh, did research on where, you know, trying to find the footprint of the race track. And um, he, you know, went, did a map search and then also um, used GIS and was able to determine where the, where the site was. And also he infers based on the, the sale actually occurred on the grandstand and he infers that the historical mark is about 300 meters from the grandstand. And then this is just a uh, another uh, map showing where the racetrack is, and um, and I think the it's sort of hard to see some of these things in this scale. But 
But anyway, um, this is the area he outlines where, where it is. Now, the, the conflict over the weeping time site is that the Salvation Army purchased it from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, to build a homeless shelter. And, um, but to get approval, they had to, um, because that area is in zone for the kind of facility that the Salvation Army would, wants to build. And so to get approval, they had to go through the city council uh, to get a special permit. And the city council voted five, four, and four against. And the permit was approved on the condition that an archaeological survey be undertaken uh, to determine um, whether the area in question or the disputed area, whether it was actually part of the racetrack at the time of the sale. And when people called me about this, they said, well, I'm not sure archaeology is going to provide you with that kind of uh, information. I mean, it, it, you know, it, was, it was hard for me to conceive of, of finding that out from archaeology. And as it turns out, they didn't find out from archaeology. They found out from doing a deed search that indicated that the proposed site um, didn't become part of the racetrack until 1864. Um, and then definitely by uh, 1871, it was actually established as part. I, I, what I think, I, I haven't seen the deeds, but it seems like the property was acquired in 1864 and then um, by the racetrack, and then they developed it later in 1871. So the city approved the permit, and the Weeping Time Coalition um, uh, uh, sued. Um, the basis for their suit, though, I'm not sure is going to help them. They, they claim that it was the archaeological report was improperly vetted with the right, uh, the correct people who should have signed off on it didn't. And, and I think that was the case at the time they issued the lawsuit, but I think that since has been corrected. But the court um, hasn't, um, the, court ruling is still um, pending. So we really don't know um, what's going to happen with the, with, with the site at, at this point. I mean, well, I shouldn't say that. The Salvation Army is moving ahead um, because they got approval and, and, the, um, and, and because they weren't able to um, they weren't able to show that the racetrack was the, the part that, that the disputed area was part of the racetrack in um, 1859 during the time of the sale. And um, this is the Weeping Time Coalition. It's a coalition of people in the neighborhood, um, various uh, organizations, and just you know interested. Uh, on people. And so um, some of my thoughts on this is, well, where was the Galagichi Cultural Heritage Corridor Commission? You know, this is one of the things that's supposed to be under their, um, under their uh, command or under their, uh, I mean, what they're supposed to look at, you know. Um, you know, on either Butler Island or the Weeping Time. Um, I, I'm, I'm not faulting them, I'm just wondering where's their voice in all of this, because I haven't heard anything about what they had to say or whether they um, were advised or anyone consulted them or, or anything. Um, and it's, I mean, knowing the, the problem is that a lot of federal commissions 
in the U.S. really don't have, they aren't decision-making bodies, they're advisory. And so that, that may be the, the main issue there. But both of these situations occurred during the COVID pandemic. And so it's possible the commission was not informed and, and that they may have not been fully operating you know, at the time. So that's because the people on the commission, that's not their primary job necessarily. Uh, you know, there are people, I mean, some of the people I know on that group, I mean, they're, um, I mean, well, actually a lot of them seem like they might be retired or something. But, um, but they probably have other responsibilities, so they don't meet, you know, regularly. And, and probably during the pandemic, if they met at all, it would have been probably um, through Zoom or something like that. And I'm not sure they got involved in this issue at all. Um, another issue is that both of these sites are associated with slavery. And it seems like to some extent that may be a factor, that there's some parties involved that want to erase the, the linkages of these sites with slavery, particularly the Weeping Time um, site. And, and I, I say that because when it, I saw a uh, YouTube video of when they did the commemoration in 2000, 2008 of the historical marker they had, a, a, and the um, director for the Historical Society of Georgia, he was saying he got a phone call from someone saying, well, why are you you know, why are you letting the, the black people in that neighborhood put up that marker? And um, he said, because that's, they're just going to get angry and, you know, and we'll, we'll start having problems. Um, and so he, you know, he said, he said, well, we're putting it up so people will know about it. It's, you know, it's been, it was silence uh, for so long. And so we're you know, letting people know what happened in this, you know, in this location. And um, um, so, sort of my final uh, statement is um, something that uh, Brett, Brent Legg, he works with the National Trust for uh, Historic Preservation, but he's a, been a pre preservation activist and actually one of the people who um, had a major role in a lot of the 1900 uh, sites on the National Register. He, he, he's played a major role in, in getting those uh, sites identified and the nominations submitted. You know, he was saying that sites, um, since I have some time, <laughs> I, I'll just give the full sort of quote. Uh, he was saying that sites that have um, inspirational legacies. You know, he says, no problem raising money to preserve those, but it's the sites like Weeping Time um, that are related to slavery. You know, he calls these um, sites of conscience, places where truth is told and visitors reflect and where reconciliation can happen. He said, those are the sites that really, you know, are difficult to convince people that they need to be preserved. And um, so my sort of final statement on this is that the U.S. still has a long way to go to reconcile its, you know, heritage legacies of, um, you know, of slavery. So thank you.